I don't know if you know this yet, but Elden Ring is a pretty difficult game. Enemies hit hard, and bosses are faster than ever compared to previous Soulsborne games, but with a combat system that many feel is ill-suited to the challenges at hand. But as with any of these games, if you grit your teeth, pay attention, practice, and persevere, those challenges can be overcome. And with even more dedication, you may even be able to internalize the game's patterns so completely that most of the difficulty all but vanishes. But Elden Ring, with its myriad of weapons and spells, means that there is no shortage of new ways to experience the game. But unfortunately, some of these tools are, well, let's just say, underwhelming. But those underwhelming options offer Elden Rolls like me new and uniquely challenging ways to try to not get killed. Between players like Plateau Peak, Scumnut, Distortion, Bushy, and this poor insane soul named Question Marks, who even suffered through the pain of a bare fist run, it seems like the number of these unique challenges are running slim, and quite quickly at that. So instead of trying to constantly one-up everyone by doing something as crazy as a I quadrupled everything in the game challenge, I thought it would be fun to instead do what some viewers have lovingly called cosplay challenge runs. Before my Doom 2016 No Jump challenge run was unceremoniously buried by a very rude platform, I conquered the lands between as a stone digger miner. And that run was so fun and y'all enjoyed it so much that I was inspired. Down at the entrance of Shifra River is a bunch of ugly, slow-moving creatures called the Claymen. I love these guys. They're probably slower than anything else in this entire game, aside from the friendly dogs. And the way that they roll around to chase you is just perfect. And you know what? I don't think that they get enough respect in this community. When's the last time you've ever heard anyone talk about a clay man? Heck, I'm pretty sure even Vadi Vidya hasn't mentioned him even once. So on this episode of Clown's Cosplay Adventures, I want to bring some respect to the common clay man. I'll be attempting to become the Elden Lord as a clay man oracle. The rootin' tootin' bubble shootin' naked blob of man that presumably lead these tribes. Maybe. I don't know, I'm not body. We make up our own lore around here. The rules for this run are simple. 1. Claymen don't wear armor, so I won't wear armor. Talismans are okay though, because talismans are fun. 2. No consumables or tools aside from flasks, runes, torrent, and one very special exception I'll mention when it becomes relevant later on. 3. No weapons. I'm a mage, not a warrior, so not even the Clayman Harpoon is legal. I'm allowed to swing my staff, though, for all the good it'll do. And 4. Clayman Sorceries only. That's only two spells in this entire game. I'll explain those very soon, too. In many ways, this is a bubble-only run. Yes, it's as stupid as it sounds, and you might be thinking, but Clown, didn't Scumnut and Distortion already do a bubble-only run? Well, yes, but also no. The bubbles that both of them used came from Oracle Horns, which are weapons and completely different bubbles with different strengths and different properties. Plus, they weren't Claymen and were allowed to wear armor, which significantly boosts their survivability no matter how bad the armor is and because of that i think those runs are kind of lame 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 <laughs> no not really they're great runs but last time i called a scum that run lame i got a million views so here's hoping anyway let's go ahead and get this run started but first, this video is sponsored by Factor 75. If you're anything like me, you've probably spent way too much on restaurant delivery services since 2020. And even worse, that food that you ordered is probably really bad for you. I don't know about you, but I'm definitely guilty of justifying that extra order of mozzarella sticks that I definitely didn't need. And yeah, cooking is great and all, but I don't always have the time for all that prep and cleanup that comes with it. And that's where Factor comes in. Factor does all the meal prep for you and delivers delicious and nutritious nutritious food right to your door weekly, making sure that you have a healthy meal on hand when you'd rather just eat and get back to doing the things that you love. These restaurant quality meals are ready in mere minutes, with no mess, no fuss, and best of all, no cleanup. Factor's flexibility allows you to pick a meal plan based on your own personal lifestyle. You can order between 4 to 18 meals per week depending on your own needs, and with vegan, keto, and even high-protein meals on the menu, there's sure to be something for just about anyone, no matter what your goals are. Between juggling YouTube, a full-time job, and still trying to recover from my house fire three years ago, I've been eyeballing this service for a while now, so I'm really glad Factor reached out to me with this opportunity so I can give it a try, and at least try 
to remove healthy eating from my list of things to stress myself out over. And now is the perfect time for you to give it a try too. You can use my link or go to go.factor75.com and use code POGCLOWN60 for 60% off your first box. Thank you to Factor75 for allowing me to bring you all a sponsor that's not just a terrible wallet draining mobile game. Now let's get this run started, shall we? First things first, we've got to create a character. The first spell that's available to us in this run is called Oracle Bubbles, and it requires a whopping 19 intelligence and 15 arcane to even use. And unfortunately for us, none of the normal starting classes can meet these. On top of that, both spells that I want to use are located in Shifra River and acquired from Teardrop Scarabs, which will be a huge pain. So instead of suffering through all of that, I went ahead and used the Elden Ring modding tools to create a custom class that shifts the stat of the astrologer around so that I can use this spell as soon as I start the game, and loaded it up with both spells so I won't have to hunt them down myself. Trust me, it's better this way, because I don't want to become the clay man, I must be the clay man. Using this custom class, I made a new character with a face that not even a mother could love. Granted, he has a bit more humanity than his peers, but perhaps that could explain his speed and why he's going on this adventure in the first place. As usual, we wake up and make our way over to the Grafted Scion, where we can really test this spell out. Oh, well, that's not good. Not only is this spell dreadfully slow in every conceivable way, from casting to projectile speed, but it doesn't even seem to do that much damage, even if most of the bubbles actually hit their target. On top of all of that is the fact that I had to sacrifice a lot of stats to create this class in the first place, and my FP bar is looking extremely pathetic. Yeah, the beginning of this run is going to be kind of rough, isn't it? Well, alright, okay, so be that way. I hope and pray that this gets a bit better over time. After getting turned into sliced deli meat by our friend here, it's time to head out into the world and do the typical start of the run chores. But before that, I wanted to give this spell some more testing against the soldiers nearby and... <laughs> Yeah, this is going to be as bad as it first seemed. But if there's one thing that I've learned from all my time with Elden Ring, it's that magic is extremely underwhelming at the beginning of the game, but can become devastating as you get closer to the end. Plus, there's an entire extra spell in our arsenal that we can't use yet and haven't had a chance to test. So I think there might be hope for this. It's time to do our flask chores though, but this time I think it's a good idea to take some extra time here to go a little more out of our way to collect plenty of smithing stones and rune consumables since I'll need quite a few stats to even begin to make this build look viable. So I stopped by my favorite local theater troupe to watch the disaster for a nice little bonus. Most of these early runes are spent to upgrade my staff and get my vigor back up to less pathetic levels, which will prove to be extremely valuable while running around completely naked with the most punishable spell imaginable. With all of that done, we're looking marginally better than before. Our health and FP still aren't great, and the damage still isn't very impressive, but we've got plenty of flasks to make up for any mistakes, so it's time to head up to Stormvale and say hello to Margit. Margit is a bit of a fast boy if he wants to be, and remember, Oracle Bubbles is a very slow spell. It takes exactly two seconds from the moment you begin casting until you're able to roll out to avoid punishment. And in Elden Ring, two seconds is a very long time against many of this game's bosses. Many of Margit's openings that would be open season for any weapon or faster spell are downright off limits for me because even though this spell is technically ranged, in actuality it's more of a close-up first option. So yeah, Oracle Bubbles functions like a silly sort of shotgun in the way that it spreads, and even though you can finesse the enemy into walking into what is essentially floating landmines, the most efficient way to ensure that you're getting as much damage out as you can is to make sure that every bubble hits the enemy as soon as it appears. All of that was just a long way to say that, at least for this fight, Oracle Bubbles is pretty much just a melee spell in the way that it functions. Most of this first attempt is spent trying to reacclimate myself to this fight with the context of this slow spell and sussing out what my openings were. I learned that for this point in the game and with how generally fragile I am, there's only two attacks out of his whole moveset that grant me 100% safe openings. The first is where Margit inhales sharply and holds his stance, resulting in either a singular quick swipe downward if you're close, or a quick charge with two swipes. Either of these results in just enough time to bubble him up before being forced to retreat again, but the best case scenario is simply forcing the single swipe and running around to his back to charge up your power washer. Though sometimes he'll just jump away before the bubbles hit if he did the two swipe version of the attack. 
Oh yeah, I haven't mentioned yet that Oracle Bubbles has two modes of casting. We have the two second long normal cast that I've only shown up until now, and a charged version that you can cast by simply holding down the button. Charging the bubbles takes about half a second longer to fully cast, but causes the bubbles to deal between 15 and 25% extra damage for the same cost, with the damage bonus getting lower as you grow stronger. And as an added bonus, the bubbles stick around for much longer before disappearing, which can allow you to set up some traps for your enemies. It's such a little thing, but this slight difference adds some very welcome depth to this style of combat, and gives me some extra options and tactics by weighing the risk and reward of any given opening. And this first opening of Margit's that I mentioned is a perfect opportunity for a power wash. His second opening is a bit trickier. By dancing in and out of his range, you can bait out some melee attacks, but the one we want is a singular upward swipe followed by a delayed downward swipe. If you're in front of him after his upward swipe, and maybe even to his right, I'm not really sure, he'll do an extremely quick follow-up with his dagger, which took me way too many runs to realize is telegraphed by the way he holds his free hand above his head after an attack. But by taking advantage of the delay after the first swipe, you're able to strafe around to his left side and begin casting early to give Margit another power wash. Both of these openings can be a bit inconsistent in terms of how many bubbles connect. It depends a lot on your timings, the specific angle created by the grade of the terrain between you and Margit, and how close you end up to his hitbox as you cast. It is, however, extremely consistent in how safe it is. As long as you execute well enough, you can do your damage and retreat safely with plenty of time to spare. And then and begin fishing for the next opening. Unfortunately, Phase 2 doesn't really present any more openings for us. Margit recovers too quickly from his extremely slow hammer swings to make anything worthwhile happen. But if you're lucky enough and have enough distance after one of his jump attacks, you can lay a minefield and hope that he just wanders into them. Phase 2 ends up being even slower than Phase 1 because you have the same amount of openings, but Margit has way more attacks available. So as long as you're patient, it's doable. I wasn't patient enough though, and I was experimenting too much and took a few too many stray hits that, after six minutes, I was the one who died. Another thing I learned is that with the abysmally slow speed of this spell, these fights are probably going to drag on a lot. And what talisman is good for a drawn out fight? That's right, Old Faithful, the hero of the Elden Roll Run, the Blessed Dew Talisman. Two health per second is not a lot, but over multiple minutes of an endurance run, it can mean the difference between running out of flasks or having just enough to squeak by. I also considered the Blue Dancer Charm, but that only boosts physical damage, so it's out of the question. So with the Blessed Dew gathered and knowledge gained, I was able to return to Margit and finally take him down on the fourth attempt after just over 12 minutes of fighting. Margit does have a third safe opening, by the way, and I didn't mention it earlier because it's not something that I was able to learn how to bait out consistently. If you manage to be at his left side when he stabs the ground, he's stuck there for a proper cleaning. I treated this mostly as a bonus for when I got lucky since I was never able to really rely on it. Anyway, with Margit thoroughly washed, it's time to head into the castle proper. There's nothing I really need in this castle, so I make a beeline straight to Godric's arena, and then bully this troll into giving me a bunch of free smithing stones by destroying this statue in the courtyard for me. The story of Godric is the same as it's ever been. The main attack to bait out is his windy jump attack, which gives you plenty of space and time to maneuver around him safely for a nice, deep clean. Occasionally, you may get a bad angle and somehow miss every single bubble, but you should have more than enough Gatorade to get the job done. You can also punish his long combo attack by rolling into his last hit and letting him have it. Godric's not too happy to be bathed against his will, so he kills me. And since I'm feeling a little weak, I decided it's best to put him off for now and head into Liurnia early to take care of some chores there. There's a lot of great little smithing stone stashes around Liurnia, and I make sure to go and grab as many as I can. I also nab the key to Hogwarts and the few golden seeds lying around to make my life a little bit easier, as well as any runes I can get my greedy little hands on. All of this lets me get my staff from plus three to plus eight, and gave me a few extra levels to take back to Godric. The extra staff levels honestly didn't help as much as I would have hoped. It amounted to something like 20 more damage per volley than I was doing before, but I guess every little bit helps. More useful though was the extra vigor and defense from leveling, and on the next attempt I got him into phase 2 where he's kind enough to stand still enough to allow me to rush in and clean up his dirty new hand. Godric has plenty of other openings like his single overhead swing and his budget meteor shower, and he tends to stand still enough and walk straight straight ahead enough that you can sneak in some lower damage, longer range shots for him to walk into. 
but by far the most dominant strategy is waiting for his whirlwind jump attack, because he loves to spam that move. With so many more openings than Margit and a little bit of extra power, Godric was dead on the third attempt after only nine minutes, despite his increased health compared to Margit. This run isn't shaping up to be too bad, all things considered. This spell is slow, but at least for this first stretch of bosses, each one has openings that are long enough to get the job done, provided you're patient enough. Yeah, I'd say things are looking up. Stormvale Castle is conquered, and with Godric's death, we've got our first great rune. But I don't care about that. What I'm more interested in is Godric's delicious, lucrative soul. Between the runes from his death and his soul, I now have enough to level my intelligence to 25 and my arcane to 18, which is enough to give us access to the next spell in the Clayman's arsenal, the Great Oracular Bubble, or Oracular. How do you say that? I also took a quick trip out to the lake to find a few more smithing stones to get my staff up to plus nine before doing this, which I only bothered to mention because of what I'm about to show you. Naturally, I'm excited to get my hands on another tool for this run. I don't do a whole lot of research before diving into these challenges, so I wasn't sure about the general viability of these spells, and I'm eager to give this new one a try. But what good is science without a control for your experiment? So I head back to the small soldier-infested forest near Kale the Merchant at the start of the game and give the first guy I find a good washing. And even with my plus 9 staff and 25 intelligence, a fully charged power wash where every single bubble hits just barely doesn't kill this guy in one shot. So with that in mind, let's try out our new toy. Holy moly. I, I'm I'm sorry, did did that say 459? Oh yeah. This is nice. This is real nice. This Mega Bubble travels much further and faster than its more shotgun-style little brother and deals significantly more damage for a marginally higher FP cost. But as slow as the small bubbles are, <laughs> this is even slower. It takes a full two and a half seconds for the projectile to materialize, and then another half second on top of that before you can roll cancel the ending animation for a total of three whopping seconds of asking your enemies to shove a sword down your throat. And just like the smaller bubbles, this too can be charged for a 25% increase in casting time, with similar benefits to damage and bubble longevity. And just so you don't have to do the math yourself, that's three and three quarter seconds of standing still. As powerful as this spell is, its speed means that its little brother will remain relevant throughout the entirety of this run, because good luck getting most of the bosses to let you breathe long enough to pull this out safely. Still though, it's a great tool to add to the toolbox. I've been thinking though, our little clay friend is pretty gifted in the ways of sorcery, but he hasn't had a formal education. Let's fix that. Our next destination is Hogwarts, and <laughs> what a mistake that was. All I want to do is learn from these people, and yet they're attacking me with extreme prejudice. That's okay though, it's an honest mistake because claymen historically haven't been very kind to outsiders either. Just to prove my intentions, I run through the area without harming a single mage, and on my way to pet the school mascot, I make a pit stop to grab the Graven School Talisman for a measly 4% extra sorcery damage. It sucks, but hey, it's better than the fat nothing I had in my second talisman slot before. I tried to be nice and kind in this school, but it seems that the mascot wants me dead too. The Red Wolf of Radagon is an extremely interesting boss. Every boss gets harder the slower your attack options get, but because of this good boy's raw speed and his tendency to bounce around the arena like a cat who saw a cucumber sneaking up on it, this boss's difficulty seems to rise exponentially so. Pair that with the fact that this magical mutt is extremely resistant to my attacks, and this is already shaping up to be one of the most difficult bosses in the game for this build. My first few attempts were, with all the futility you can imagine, spent trying desperately to make my new big boy bubble spell work. But it just doesn't. The wolf's speed against my lack of it means that there's a large degree of luck involved in not only actually hitting the boss with this spell, but also not getting hit in return. Eventually, I evolved my strategy to only ever cast the Mega Bubble once as I entered the arena, and hoped that I would get lucky enough for the boss to not dodge it completely. More often than not, though, it would just miss. But it's the only shot I can safely take, so I might as well. The only true opening I was able to find in this frenetic fight was after the 
the wolf's huge jumping attack. You can get behind the wolf as it lands and give its bum a nice wash. I thought the dog would appreciate this because as every parent of a long-haired pet knows, sometimes a little something-something gets stuck in the fur back there, and it's, it's not pleasant. This only seemed to agitate him more though, and after 11 attempts over a little under half an hour, I decided to come back later after I powered up a bit. So I went to hunt for smithing stones. My first stop was the ruin-strewn precipice for a bunch of smithing stone fours, and once I cleared that out of materials, I took my Dectus medallion to the lift and arrived at the Altus Plateau, where I did the usual flask chores and then went spelunking into the sealed tunnel. I spent way too much time here. This cave is a great resource though, because it offers the second smithing stone bell bearing just for going inside. But there's also plenty of free stones and even a statue that you can coax an abductor into destroying for you. I died a few times trying to get these stones, which is where most of my time was spent as I slowly and diligently sniped the little men from the safety of my tree branch before venturing further. And once I was finally finished in this room, I let my greed take over and ventured further into the cave for more stones, which as far as I know is impossible to escape from without dying or warping out. Normally I would just die or warp out, but at this point I had 20,000 runes on hand and I wasn't too keen on letting these go. So I went ahead and did the unnecessary by killing the Onyx Lord at the bottom of this dungeon. He was kind of a pain since he likes to dodge away from my bubbles as I shoot them, but enough bubbles were able to meet their mark and the weird pile of rocks in the center of the room blocks the enemy's projectiles, so it wasn't too bad. And for my troubles, I was able to get my staff all the way up to plus 14 with enough left over to pump my vigor and mind levels just a little bit more. And with that taken care of, it's time to visit the doggo once more. Hmm, well, uh, all right. I guess that's still not happening. I suppose I could go and fight the Draconic Tree Sentinel, but there's not much of a point in doing that without a second Great Rune to gain access to the city, so I guess the only other choice I have right now is Radon? Since I've already visited the plateau, that should mean that the anti-Radon mob is out for blood, and sure enough, here they are. I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't extremely worried about this fight. Radon is a tough nut to crack sometimes, with hard-hitting attacks and difficult-to-read moves that I've never gotten completely comfortable with dodging. And and since I'm wearing no armor and I'm a pretty low level coming into this fight, every hit is bound to be devastating. However, this build, paired together with this arena and Radon's unique set of moves and abilities, offers us a very unique advantage. Look, growing up, my mom wanted me to become a lawyer, and I always told her, no, I want to be a mobile artillery. And finally, I can live out the career of my child. <laughs> Radon's attacks are so drawn out and so linear in their movement that it becomes trivial to chip away at his health from a distance using our newly acquired Mega Bubble. Even shots that a more typical ranged attack might struggle with are made possible by the bubble's ability to turn into a floating landmine that Radon himself can't help but want to pop. And can you blame him? Who doesn't love to pop bubbles? It's not a particularly exciting fight though. The main strategy consists of running around until Radon decides to stand still and wind up an attack, which is my cue to make a little more space and blow a bubble for Radon to run himself into. If you know the Radon fight though, you know that he's not content to simply just swing his sword. He's a master of gravity magic after all, and he's gonna use it. Unfortunately for him, I'm a master of dismounting Torn for invincibility frames magic and I'm not afraid to use that. I misread one of his attacks though and get stuck on some rubble and get turned into dust. And even though this doesn't feel quite as unapproachable as the magical mutt does, I decided it's best to go find some more smithing stones. After taking out my frustrations on the local knight population in Altus, I make my way back to Kaelid to visit the Celia Crystal Tunnel and leave with enough rocks to get my staff to plus 16, but I still want more. And there's one creature that I know of that is a great source of smithing stones, the Falling Star Beast. There's a few of these in the game, including one in the tunnel that I just left, but the only one that I feel may be within my power to defeat right now is sitting just outside of the capital. So I head up there and prepare for a fight. This is the first encounter where I felt the need to swap between my spells dynamically as the fight calls for it. 
The bread and butter, of course, is using the Mega Bubble on this creature's rolling attack or its Rock Sling with face attack. But in the case where it goes for a relatively slow melee attack, I tried my best to be ready to react with a quick spell switch and a power wash. On the third attempt after an 8 minute battle, the Falling Star Beast goes down and rewards me with a nice little collection of smithing stones and other rocks I guess I'll never use. Still not satisfied, I ran all the way to the Hermit Village in Mount Gelmir to retrieve the smithing stones from this statue with the help of a very, very angry rune bear, which gave me what I needed to push my staff to plus 19. We're still not done quite yet though, because it's at this point that I remembered that a recent patch introduced an alternative way to complete Vare's questline. Before, you were required to invade other players a total of three times. But now all you gotta do is head up to these ruins in the Altus Plateau near Mount Gelmir, and this red invasion sign will be on the ground. I'm not sure if you have to defeat him or just invade him three times, and since I finally killed him on my third attempt after a lot of finagling with his player-like dodge-happy AI, I'm no closer to the answer than I was before. Either way, I was able to complete that portion of the quest, then headed up to the frenzied village in Liernia for another sacred tear and some fresh maiden's blood, and I was off to Mogwin's palace with the added bonus of looking more beautiful than ever. Look at those eyes, and how they peer into your soul. Gorgeous. I then spent the next 15 minutes at the famous Sad Boy Farm near the start of the zone, leaving only when I had enough intelligence to kill a single Sad Boy with just two Mega Bubbles, putting me at rune level 48. By now, I should be able to take on the Hogwarts mascot, right? With all of my power mongering, my damage is now so high that a single shotgun power wash now does more damage than a charged Mega Bubble did during my first attempts which means this fight is now more in reach than ever. And on my second attempt back, after only five minutes, the good boy is put down. Rest in bones, good boy. Rest in bones. Now, technically, I don't have to clear out Hogwarts to beat the game. I can always accomplish what I need by taking out Radon for his great rune, but I want to prove a point that Claymen are the superior sorcerers. And not just that, but this good boy was blocking access to a very important tool for this run, the Radagon Icon. I forgot to record myself making my way to this chest, but here it is, a talisman that increases my casting speed by the equivalent of 40 dexterity. I'm not actually able to tell if it makes a difference or not, but I want it to, and that's enough for me. So this talisman will replace the Graven School talisman and remain equipped for the rest of the run. And for the record, remember the casting time stats that I gave you earlier in the video? Yeah, those were measured with this talisman already equipped, so now those stats are accurate. It's hard to imagine that it was even slower before. Next up on the chopping block is Renala, or she should be. I have no illusions that I'll be able to defeat her quite yet though. Her extreme magic resistance and multi-phase fight means that even if I manage to not die to her deluge of spells and swarms of spirit summons, I'm definitely gonna run out of Gatorade before the fight is over. Phase one of this fight is the only reason I didn't explicitly rule out the ability to swing my staff, because the Gatorade shortage would have been even more devastating if I had to use my bubbles to break Renala's. Even with the help of the staff though, this phase is extremely slow. Not only am I unable to get many attacks in per cycle, but the damage I'm doing to her is nothing short of pathetic. 13 cycles. It took me 13 cycles to finally take down her phase one. And to put that number into context, that's the exact minimum number it took for me to take down her phase one while rolling her to death with the briar armor. And at least in that run, I wasn't limited by my blue. After 13 cycles in just under 12 minutes, Good lord, I finally pushed her to phase 2 with barely any FP remaining and only two bottles of Gatorade, which I don't even get the chance to use since I get absolutely perforated by her magic missiles. She doesn't seem to give me many opportunities to cast either, and when she does, there's a decent chance that she'll either simply dodge it or go into her magic-sucking moon form to make my spells useless. The moon isn't even an opening I could use either, because it literally sucks in any magic nearby and nullifies it. Which means <laughs> I don't stand a chance. Not yet, anyway. But I'll be back. Look, I want Renala dead as much as you probably do, but it just can't be done without some tools that I don't currently have access to. But at this point, it's 100% clear to me that Radon is my way forward. I also just happen to remember that even though I can't wear any armor, there is a very helpful defense talisman that I've been neglecting that I could have grabbed at the very start of the game. Just behind the bestial sanctum in Kaelid is a very annoying parkour section, and at the very bottom is the Dragoncrest shield talisman. It took 
took me three attempts to not fall to my death like an absolute moron, uh, but eventually the prize was mine. This talisman will get swapped in and out as needed, but for Radon, the 10% physical damage reduction will come in more handy than 2 health per second. And for this fight, I took full advantage of a trick that some commenters informed me of. If you travel backwards to the beach upon teleporting into the fight, you can push Radon outside of the game's draw distance. This messes with his AI, and when you get him back in your vision, he'll be confused and start immediately charging you with his swords, skipping the extremely annoying ranged phase. It doesn't seem to be completely consistent, but it's better than dealing with that run-up every time. The strategy is the same as before. Run around, bait an attack, and punish accordingly. You don't have to worry too much about being out of range in this fight. If you're far enough away, he'll just run in a straight line towards you and, more importantly, a straight line into your big bubbly <laughs> a straight line into your big bubbly landmine that you've put in his way. It was easy to get into a bit of a groove while staying extremely safe with the help of good old Torrent, and the invincibility frames allowed by dismounting let me avoid his large gravity suck spell. And on only the third attempt back, I was feeling pretty good until he transitioned into phase two. Hey bro, watch your jet. Watch your jet, bro. Watch your jet! Um, uh, well, <laughs> uh, that's, em <laughs> that's embarrassing. I haven't been killed by that attack since they nerfed Radon a month after launch. He doesn't track very well with that attack anymore, so I, I thought I was safe just standing still. <laughs> Lesson learned, I guess. The fourth attempt was looking even better, though, and the transition to Phase 2 went off without a hitch. Also, did you know that Radon can use the Meteor attack twice in the same fight? Because I definitely didn't. Towards the end of this fight, he went up into the sky for a second time. Really surprised me. After he landed again, all it took was a few more Mega Bubbles, and Radon was out for the count. When you have an attack with such an obscenely long range as the Mega Bubble with Torrent available to help you keep your distance, <laughs> It ends up being a surprisingly easy fight. And with the second Great Rune finally in our possession, we have all the keys we need to enter the Golden City of the Scorching Sun. Uh, I mean, Landel. Sorry, too much anime. Look, I know I've been hyping up Landel a bit, but hear me out. Rinala simply must be slain, there's no way around it. And unfortunately, I don't think I can get it done without bringing in some hired help. What sucks is that this help lives deep below the earth in locations that are only accessible through Ronnie's quest line. So before we head into the city, we've got to visit the old cities first. And to do that, we've got to take a trip to Karia Manor and wash through Loretta. So that's our next stop. I wasn't too sure how this fight would play out. Loretta can be downright oppressive when she wants to be, and and she also has a particularly rude habit of bouncing left and right fairly often. That means that the Mega Bubble may have some uses, but it's going to miss a lot. The best time to bust out the Mega Bubble is when she casts her Glintstone Phalanx. That spell takes just long enough to cast with just enough downtime that it's pretty easy to send a big old bubble her way, and if it hits, great! If not, oh well. Her health is pretty low, so it's not like you're gonna run out of FP in this fight anyway. The far more reliable strategy is to just wait for her to charge into melee, dodge the first swipe, then run around to her other side to wash her armor, and then dodge out. Between these two opportunities, Loretta will be dead in no time. For some reason, I completely dropped the big bubble strategy later on in the fight, and didn't even figure out the small bubble strategy until late either, so this fight took a bit longer than it should have, Still, she was dead on the first attempt after just over nine minutes. Not bad. Now I can go say hi to Ronnie, who seems to be completely unimpressed by my devilishly good looks, and then I head down to Nokron and make my way to the Mimic Tier fight. Sure, I could remove my staff and make this fight completely free, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to have a good old-fashioned bubble battle. <laughs> look, at, look at it. Isn't it magical? Bubbles everywhere! It's literally paradise. Our bubble buddy here can get a little dodgy with his player-like AI, but since his spells take as long to cast as mine do, we're basically playing a game of chicken. Who's brave enough to cast knowing that there may be a bubble on the way? Regardless, the fight's easy, and Bubble Buddy goes down without much issue. With the Mimic out of the way, it's just a quick run to pick up Ronnie's groceries, which allows me access to the half of Einzel River that I really want. And just slightly off the beaten path, down this stream and tucked away on a corpse, are my boys, the Clayman Ashes. They're a little weak right now, so I've got to visit a few catacombs to collect some Glovewort to power them up. I can get them to plus 7 for now with the Glovewort that I have 
accessible to me, so it's time to give Renala another try. This attempt didn't fare much better than the first. It only took 12 cycles this time instead of 13, but that's still pretty painful. But this is what I was waiting for, phase two. I run all up in her face and prepare to bring my boys to the party and... wait. I can't summon them? That's weird. I want to give her a good attempt anyway, but I completely missed the dodge here and died. Well, that was a remarkable waste of 10 minutes. Time for Landel, I guess. But it is weird that I couldn't summon the boys. The Draconic Tree Sentinel in front of Landel is a boss that always really worries me in these runs. He's just as dangerous as he looks, and much faster than his stature implies. All because of one very quick move the fireball. This guy loves to spam this move on every second or third attack, especially if you build any amount of distance between the two of you. Our Mega Bubble offers us a unique advantage here though, and with each attempt I try to push that advantage further and further. So as you approach the Sentinel before initiating combat, it likes to walk towards you, and once it's close enough or is damaged, it lets out a war cry to signal the start of battle. But I don't have time for such formalities. With the slow speed and high range of my Mega Bubble, I can fire off a few for some easy, guaranteed damage at the start of the fight. From there though, the threat of a stray fireball means I'm locked into the shotgun for the rest of the fight. For most of the fight, my strategy was simply to get around to his shield side and try to bait out an attack, which I can then avoid and take the opportunity to clean him up a bit. The easiest way to accomplish this is hope that he charges at you with a jump attack, which he'll sometimes extend into a second or third hammer swing for an easy punish. Failing that, baiting out the shield strike gets the job done all the same. Often though, you'll be forced to approach him after he runs away and begins his fireball spam. Just dodge through all the junk, taking extra care to dodge late if the horse rears up to do a point-blank fireball against the ground. Before too long, he'll enter phase two, where the pace of the fight slows down significantly. This is because he gains access to three completely unpunishable lightning attacks. On my second attempt, I ran out of Estus around this time and died. But that's when I realized that I was missing a talisman slot. So I went back to the round table to collect it, equipped the Dragon Crest Shield Talisman, and began the grind. As mentioned, in each attempt, I tried to push the starting advantage as much as I possibly could. And what I found is that if I position myself just right, I can start stacking bubbles near the boss. These Mega Bubbles have a maximum range, and once they reach that range, they'll hover until something either touches them or they expire. Even if they expire, they'll still explode for full damage to anything in their radius. So if I get a few bubbles stacked up, then trigger the boss to begin moving, he'll take a large amount of damage in a very short amount of time. Every cast of the Mega Bubble inches me forward slightly, so I'm able to start outside of his detection range while stacking the initial bubbles, and keep casting while I approach. And eventually, either a bubble will hit him, or he'll start moving towards me. If my starting position was good enough, I'm able to hit him with seven Mega Bubbles before even beginning beginning the fight, since the fifth explosion will break his stance. This destroys the first 40% of his health bar and comes remarkably close to completely skipping the first phase of the fight. During the grind, I also discovered that there are a few more opportunities for Mega Bubbles than I originally thought. Two of his lightning attacks can leave enough of an opening if I'm fast enough and lucky enough. His lightning field is the one that relies mostly on luck. If you're spaced far enough away from him when he casts it, and if you can find a safe position quickly enough, you'll have just enough time to launch a bubble. Most of the time this one doesn't line up, but it's worth keeping an eye out for. The other opening is his extremely dangerous lightning wave attack. He does this massive sweep and follows it up with an enormous lightning slam. With some practice, you can begin to predict when he'll want to use this ability, and if you're positioned on his shield side when he does use it, you can simply run behind him to avoid the sweep, and then away to avoid the slam. This is your opportunity to show him the power of pledge, baby. Suds him up to your heart's content. With some patience, practice, and if you're able to avoid enough damage, the Sentinel will go down. I got him down on the 11th attempt after just a 9 minute fight. Without the slight cheese at the start, it probably would have stretched to 13 or 14 minutes. After gaining access to the city, I take a quick detour back to the Celia Crystal Tunnel to kill the Falling Star Beast there for more rocks and get my staff to plus 19. And then I make my way up to the Golden Ghost of Godfrey. Not much to say about this fight, honestly, he's literally a shade of his true self and isn't very aggressive at all. It's very easy to get some range and continually blast him with bubbles 
kills from a distance, so he was down on the first attempt after a little over three minutes. He gives up the fourth talisman slot too, which allows me to finally re-equip my Graven School talisman. Yeah, I know it's only 4% damage, but hey, what else am I gonna use? Next up though is King Morgoth himself, and he's a lot more scary and mobile than his nephew Margit, so it can be difficult to find a true opening here. For phase one, I'm able to open up with a couple of bubbles, and then I ended up blasting him after his double lunge jump attack, which he'd sometimes just rudely dodge anyway. Other good opportunities include his sword rain, which is super easy to take advantage of since it takes him forever to cast, and his spin to win, which is easily punished as long as you manage to fully avoid it. None of his hammer attacks seemed safe to punish, which feels a bit weird, but it's not a big deal. With enough patience, it's not too much work to push him into phase two, which gives you a massive opportunity to get a nice head start while he's busy puking all over the floor. From here, the game changes a little bit. You're still looking for the same jump attack and sword rain opportunities, but his spin to win changes from the sword version to the hammer version, which is slightly less safe to punish. There's also a very slow overhead swing that you can take advantage of if you spot it. And finally, both of his new blood attacks, the thrust and the swipe with the explosions, can be responded to. You can use a shotgun against the thrust, but he'll often dodge it and it might not even be safe at all, but the swipe is a great opportunity to get some damage in. As long as you're not taking too many risks, this fight's not too bad. He was dead on just the second attempt after a nine minute battle. I'm on a bit of a tear right now, and I know that the fire giant is going to be a bit of a problem to fight with nothing more than a few cleaning supplies, so I immediately run towards his arena, making sure to grab the flame drake talisman on the way out of the city and any flask goodies along the way. The fire giant is a bit of a mixed bag. I've gotten pretty good at fighting this behemoth because of my briar armor shenanigans, but considering we're officially entering late game territory here and I'm still feeling the breeze between my thighs, things are more dangerous than ever. A single hit is capable of wiping out two thirds of my health or more, so I need to be extremely careful. Lucky for us though, this guy is just as slow as we are, and most of his attacks offer a nice opportunity to pop a mega bubble into his ankle. Most of his fire attacks are off limits, but at least half of his melee attacks, if you could call them that with his ridiculous reach, leave him and his bum leg wide open for an attack. Phase 2 is where this gets really tough though, because even with the tried and true strategy of fighting the giant from his front, it's difficult to get a clean shot off. His arms move around way too much for me to be comfortable with targeting, so I decide to go for his eye with the weaker but faster version of my Mega Bubble. Both versions of his two-armed slam, the heavy slam by itself and the follow-up after a single arm swipe, are the best opportunities for some easy damage. He'll also slam his left palm into the ground, and usually if you're close to him, he'll follow up with a swipe from his other arm, but if you dodge away and keep enough distance, he'll do nothing instead and give you a chance to send him a present. Because the bubble has a further distance to travel when targeting the giant's eyeball, the bubble will occasionally hit one of his more protected body parts for half damage, or even worse, he'll sometimes just dodge it completely somehow. By now though, you should have enough mind and Gatorade to make up for the missed shots. If you hit his head though, which is pretty common after a slam, you'll do full damage and you'll occasionally get lucky and get him right in his big ugly eyeball for nearly double damage, which helps make up for all the misses and lower damage hits. It's slow going and extremely dangerous, and if you're not good at dodging his double fireballs, this is going to be a pretty difficult fight to win. And every time he rears up to belch fire all over the battlefield, I found myself clenching my cheeks especially hard since fire can be extremely unpredictable in this game. On the fourth attempt after 19 minutes of stressful combat, the fire giant's soul is mine. Since I don't need any of the boss weapons, I've been eating every single boss soul I've earned to help me level up, and the Fire Giants is especially delicious. Defeating the Fire Giant is always an important milestone in these runs, and I'm eager to move on, but we have some unfinished business. After a quick trip to the nearby Hero's Grave and a visit to the Round Table, it's time to return to Renala. This time, I've gained enough power to knock out Phase 1 in only 9 cycles. Still a lot, but each cycle saved is more Gatorade that I can take into the next phase. And as Renala charges up her Kamehameha, I run up into her armpits and prepare to bring out the boys. Except, huh, that's weird, I still can't summon them? I thought that last time it was because I didn't have enough blue to bring them out, but that's definitely not the case this time. Huh, I guess you can't summon spirits in this phase. Oh well. Just like before, I'm gonna do my best to beat her normally, I guess. 
Things are going pretty well this time around, but extremely slow. She really doesn't give a lot of opportunities to cast a Mega Bubble, and like I mentioned before, she has multiple ways to nullify my attacks between her frequent dodging and her Moon Spell. Even worse, I'm not sure that I brought enough Gatorade into the Moon Zone here, so I'm not sure if this is possible this time around. I managed to get Renala down to around half health, and when I realize that I have so much more to do with only one bottle of Gatorade left, I let her end me so I can restock and try again. So I pack two extra bottles of what plants crave and start heading back into Renala's room. But the entire time I'm thinking, hey, it's pretty weird that I wasn't able to bring out the boys for Renala. It's strange that phase two doesn't allow for summons. But see, that literally doesn't make sense. Every arena and every boss allows summons. It makes no sense for this one phase of this one boss to break that rule. I've seen people do it too. And it's not until I start the fight again that it dawns on me. I never got the bell from Ronnie. <laughs> Whoops. So I let the freaky children kill me, which takes a surprisingly long time, and then I head back to the round table to collect the bell before returning to Renala for, hopefully, one last time. Such a silly little mistake. By the way, this bell is the exception to the no tools rule that I mentioned at the start of the video. After suffering through another handful of cycles from Renala's phase one, I run up into her majestic armpits and summon my backup, and, well, I wasn't expecting a lot from these boys, but man, they were far less helpful than I was hoping for. They managed to take some heat off me at the start of the fight, allowing me to get in a few crucial shots, but once Renala builds some distance from them, these boys aren't really doing much of anything anymore. Renala won't bother to target them unless they land a hit, but their mega bubbles don't go quite as far as mine do, and they have an extremely difficult time figuring out how to close the gap and land a shot. So when I'm not busy casting, I'm trying to dodge around in a way that'll keep the boss close enough to the boys so that they can do the job that I hired them for. Every time the boys get her attention, I'm able to fire off two Mega Bubbles. The first one staggers her for so long that even if she decides to suddenly target me before I hit her, there's more than enough time to send another one her way before I have to begin running away again. And with the help, it doesn't take much time at all for her to start summoning her own backup. This is where things start to get tricky though. All of her summons and the way she teleports around the field make it pretty difficult to manipulate her positioning. And even worse than that, the boys will, without fail, always target whatever creatures Renala summons, which causes them to go off course and get too far away from Renala herself to actually be of any assistance. For the entirety of this fight, her Kamehameha wave is her biggest vulnerability, and if nothing else, I can use that to chip away at her health as long as there's not a bloodhound knight chasing me or something. And if I get lucky, the boys can eventually close the distance, land a hit, and open her up to some pain from me. She also tends to remain relatively passive while while her summons are out on the field, and out of the four types of monsters that she can bring out, it turns out that the best one for me in this fight is her dragon. The dragon's attacks are slow and predictable, and it doesn't move around a lot, which allows me to sometimes sneak in some lemon fresh pine sol if I'm positioned well enough. I'm also so overleveled for this encounter by now that even without any armor, my damage resistance is so high that I'm not at any real risk of death, so I can take a few extra risks. It's a slow and arduous battle, with a lot of running and waiting for the perfect opportunity to cast. And as if the Clayman gods themselves heard my cries of frustration, at the very end, after chasing literal ghosts for a majority of the fight, the remaining boy distracts Renala one last time and falls over dead, leaving me with just enough of an opportunity to land the killing blow. <sighs> What a mess that fight was, but it's finally over. I wanted Renala dead for many reasons. The first, and most important, was to take over the Academy for the Clayman Kingdom. But I also wanted her remembrance so I could use her staff. With somewhere around 65 intelligence, the Carrion Regal Scepter is the most powerful staff in the game. I don't quite have the required stats to use it yet, but we can build it up for later. And with the Queen of the Full Moon finally cleaned out of the Academy, we can finally stop looking behind us and start pushing forward. But before heading off to Faramazula, I have a few more errands that I've got to take care of. Faramazula may be calling our names loudly, but something even louder rings out in my skull. Something 
that comes from below. It seems to be coming from the city, beneath the well where the omens are cast, and even deeper still as I pass the rats and garbage left to rot just underneath the city. And as I descend ever lower, I come face to face with an imposing figure, Moog the Omen. This being is the only one standing between me and what I now know is my ultimate destiny. As big and as slow as Moog is, his arena is cramped, making it difficult to find a safe place to stand and blow my bubbles. His blood rain is the best opportunity I have to deal some damage, but since I have no desire to be near him, he chooses to use it less often than he normally does. Occasionally, I am able to find the distance I need to fire a shot safely, but it's too slow, so I observe. I watch Moog as he swings, and I pay attention to how he reacts as I weave through his every strike. And that's when it hits me. If I dodge close enough to him that he finishes his combo with a ground stab instead of ending it early, I'll have just enough time to wash away his sins. And so begins the dance. Around the room we spin, in a glorious waltz of bubble and blood. Two opposing yet equally powerful elements trapped in what seems like a never-ending swirl of motion. As we spin and spin and spin, the room seems to simply melt away with time, and we both begin to stumble beneath our own weight, making more and more mistakes as the fatigue of a prolonged battle sets into our joints. Eventually, the sacred tears run dry. From here on, all injuries sustained will remain until one of us falls. But the voice, it grows louder. I have gained its favor, and it seems to infuse me with its power as we trade blows. But finally, Moog succumbs to his fatigue and falls to the floor after 18 minutes on the second attempt. And as the omen goes down, so too do I descend ever deeper into the abyss, until I finally reach it. The voice has calmed into a faint whisper by now, pulling me forward step by step. I open the doors and let myself be embraced by the hot phalanges of a being greater than I. I am no longer the bubble buddy you once knew. I am now the inheritor of the frenzied bubble. Well, that was fun. Seriously though, Moog was tough. Much tougher than I expected him to be. Even in this form, he remains my favorite fight in this game. I really only wanted to do this because I haven't done a video with the frenzied flame ending yet, and I thought it would be kind of fun to watch our clay friend throw himself into a burning cauldron to destroy the world. And don't ask me why I decided to make that whole thing so dramatic, I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, we finally made it to Community's Gas Leak Year, but there's still something that I want to do before getting too deep into this place, so I rush to the first grace I can find and head back to the mountaintop of the Giants to pay a little visit to our old friend, Commander Neil. Those of you who know Commander Niall well already know that he's very rude and won't fight alone at the start, so I immediately call in the boys for backup and begin to run around like a headless chicken because, oh yeah, I totally forgot that enemies don't bother to target the summon until they actually land a hit, which these guys aren't very good at despite all my attempts to assist them in doing so. All it takes is one good shot from them though, and it's enough to allow me to finish off the dual wielding spirit. Just a few seconds later and they manage to land another hit on the shield guy, which allows me to damage it so my boys can finish cleaning him up. Good job fellas, you gotta kill! And with that, Commander Null goes into phase two and immediately kills my friends. Oh well, they did their job well this time, so I'm proud of them. For the rest of the fight, it's just another another Tuesday. Gain some distance and Negan will do one of two attacks. If he chooses to jump with a lightning stomp, you can dodge, bait out a follow-up attack, and then launch a mega bubble. If Nelson decides to frost charge you instead, you're only guaranteed a safe retaliation if he follows up with another wind burst which you can bait out if necessary. Stick to the routine and Nebula will go down pretty easily. One attempt over eight minutes. I claim the half of the Halig Tree medallion that he was guarding and return to Liernia for the other half, and then it's off to the consecrated snowfield. I go. I make a quick stop to kill Anastasia the Tarnished Eater for her max level somber smithing stone, but the real reason that I'm here is to scour the mines for smithing stone 8s, which when combined with the ancient dragon smithing stone I picked up before fighting the fire giant will finally allow me to max out my glintstone staff. And if you know what's coming up, you know how much we're going to need this extra bubble power. That's right, it's everyone's favorite fight, the Godskin Duo. 
Uh, surprise, surprise, Awful Boss is still awful, but it's made even worse by the fact that I've outlawed tools and consumables for this run, and even armor, which means that there will be no nappies allowed today. And since they love to throw black fireballs whenever they get too bored, I've got to be extremely deliberate and extremely careful about when I choose to cast. Of course, as soon as I enter the arena, I bring the boys out, and of course, they immediately target the enemy that's on the other side of the um, gazebo thing, while the big boy chases after me. Thanks guys, R real cool. Most of my time is spent running in circles, desperately hoping that my backup will pull some aggro off of me so I can get a few easy shots in, or at the very least, keep one of them distracted so I can have an easier time finding an opening on the other one. It's much easier to cast spells when only one stay puffed understudy is chucking fire at your feet after all. My clayman friends don't buy me nearly as much time in this fight as they did in the other ones. They get absolutely shredded by Squidward while I'm trying to deal with Patrick, and due to the nature of their AI and attack patterns against my bubbles, I'm feeling lucky if I can shave 10% off of their health bar by the time my friends die. And for the rest of the fight, I'm alone. With the slow speed of my bubbles, if either of the godskins have line of sight on me, I can't risk a cast. And my mega bubble without my own line of sight is just as useless as their fireballs are without it. But yet again, the small bubbles come to the rescue with their unique mechanics. My sole strategy was to run around the arena, constantly breaking line of sight and forcing them to come around corners, where I'll have a nice field of bubble mines for them to walk into on their own. As aggressive as they are, it's just a matter of time until the big boy takes takes enough hits to slip into phase two. As dangerous as this phase can be, it's also my best opportunity to deal a ton of damage. By letting him break down my safety gazebos, I have a platform that the big guy usually can't roll into. And as long as Skinny is patient and waits his turn like a good, I said wait your turn, jeez. <clears throat> as long as Skinny waits his turn, I can give Fatty a really good scrub down. It's not enough to kill him in one go, so I've got to run around with even more stress than before, continuing the same bubble mine strategy as before until Sonic 2 releases. And you might be tempted to think that destroying the gazebos means that I'm out of safe options, but as long as you're on the other side of one of the platforms against its base, while one of the godskins chucks a fireball at you from the opposite side and a reasonable distance away from that platform, the projectile will never hit you. And even better, the gazebo being destroyed means that there's more space for me to lay more precise traps to whittle them down. Eventually, Big Man dies, and it's just me and Skinny for the time being. At some point, I discovered that as long as I'm far enough away when they throw a fireball, I can dodge and immediately send a mega bubble right back at them. Of course, Skinny likes to try and dodge these, but as long as you're in the narrow hallways between the gazebos and the wall, he'll have nowhere to go. And sometimes he's so trigger happy that I'm able to get a lot of bubbles off in a row as we trade shots, with only mine meeting their mark. From here, the fight can go in many directions. There's absolutely no chance of even getting close to killing Skinny here before he revives his friend, so the fight can get pretty chaotic. On my winning attempt, I was able to do enough damage to push Skinny into phase two, right as the big man waddles back into the arena, and I started to panic a little bit. This was the attempt that I saved my summon for later in the fight, and I even tried a maxed out mimic tier, which, to my surprise, lasted even less time than the clay crew. So that was kind of a pointless waste of health. Obviously, with Skinny in Phase 2, I tried my absolute hardest to exploit any opportunity I could find to finish him off, but for nearly every shot I was able to take, Wide Load over here was able to sneak his way in almost every single time and take the hit for his bro. And before I knew it, both of them were angry in tandem. Great. Okay, okay, just don't panic and follow the plan. Pivot your strategy back to targeting the big man and try to finish him off as quickly as possible so you can focus on the little one. It should be much easier to manage this way instead of trying to hit the more elusive one. And after a series of extremely close calls, a minor amount of panic as I run out of Estus, and a ton of damage on the fat man, he goes roly-poly and delivers himself straight to me. Yeah, so remember how I said that this was my winning attempt? Well, I wasn't able to kill him during his little outburst 
Horus this time. I got close, but I needed one more volley to take him down. And that's when he immediately plumps up again to prepare for an airdrop, and I got extremely greedy. The skinny guy is closing in, but I'm thirsty for this kill, so I dodge, move in, and begin to cast right as the thin man enters my own personal bubble and begins his own version of spin to win. I really shouldn't have gotten greedy here and wait, I survived? What the hell? That was extremely reckless and not worth the risk, but somehow it worked out. I'm out of Estus though, and victory is so close that I'm extremely nervous. One more hit from anything is the end of this attempt, so I bide my time until I get an opening, and as Skinny brings his own bubble buddy back for the second time, I move in for the kill. From here, it should be simple. Fatty doesn't dodge, and he's alone. A few more bubbles is all it should take. I fire one as he spawns. Then I back up and take an extremely ill-advised shot that would have ended the attempt if Fatty had chosen to throw a fireball in that moment. And then I dodge a fireball for another bubble, and that's when he begins to summon. I'm currently at the end of the room where the new god skin is going to spawn, but I decide to take the shot anyway, and then immediately run away. So close. I chug my second to last Gatorade and revert to the strategy that began this fight, Bubble Mines. After tons of fear and a few more extremely close calls, they finally walk into one last set of bubbles and die. Damn, that was rough. The winning attempt took just over 14 minutes of fighting, but somehow this fight always feels like it takes so much longer than that. The fire giant took 19 and it felt like nothing, but this? It's just so stressful and unpredictable. I even got to experience a new layer to just how broken and terrible this fight is. Like, excuse me? You can just do that? All in all, the fight took me about 16 attempts over two hours. I'm glad my stone digger never had to fight these fools. Can you even imagine? Now that this fight's over with, it's time to head to Malaketh. And, well, Malaketh is hard. At least, phase two is. My briar armor shenanigans allowed me to get the clergyman phase down to a pretty precise science. Wait for a stab, roll a few times while staying in his range while being sure not to end up inside his model, and punish his ground stab finisher. You can even get up to two mega bubbles off on him as you enter the fight for a head start depending on how quickly he decides to rush you down. Sometimes you get zero, sometimes you get two. It's just a roll of the dice. Phase two is a different story though. I was never able to learn it thoroughly, and being extremely naked means I'm dead in one or two hits. So after four extremely quick deaths to phase two, I decide to go on a little quest for power, and my first visit is to the Halig Tree. Lighting the candles for entry to the Halig Tree was a bad time. Those dang archers are faster than I can cast, and even at a distance, I can't stack enough bubbles to kill them before they start firing back at me. But while I was trying to line up a cheeky little shot to deal some explosion damage from around the corner, I missed and discovered that these archers are extremely easily distracted. By free-aiming a bubble to shoot past them, the explosion will cause the archers to turn around and look at where the bubble exploded, which lets you shoot more bubbles at their back. Not honorable, but it does the job and earns me access to the Halig Tree. Not wanting to waste time, I rush straight to Loretta's arena and to not waste your time since I already covered this fight earlier, I'll keep it brief. In short, the fight was almost exactly the same as before, just quite a bit more lethal. The same tricks from before still work, so that's what I did, and she went down on the sixth attempt after eight and a half minutes. After that, I headed down to El Fail, the brace of the Halig Tree. It's probably called that because it's such a terrible place to navigate. Luckily, we have a handy dandy elevator death shortcut to... Um, <clears throat> let me try that again. Luckily, we have a handy dandy... Um... Handy... uh... dandy? Well, crap. I guess the most recent patch removed this skip. Normally, you could just throw your body at the bottom of this elevator and it'll hit the button, but it doesn't seem to work anymore. Dang, I guess I gotta do this the old-fashioned way. Down the stairs, across the bridge, through the rot swamp after cleaning out some of the infestation, and bada-bing, bada-boom, we made it to the church! This is what I'm really here for anyway. The Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman, which is a whopping 20% physical damage reduction instead of a measly... 17. I picked up the Dragon Crest plus two in Faramazula, but looking at the wiki now, I realize that the Great Shield Talisman is better, but not as significantly as I thought. Oh well, I guess I'll still use it. 
And hey, while I'm down here, I might as well give a couple of tries to the Queen of Blades herself. When I started this run, I didn't expect these silly little bubble spells to hold quite so many unique advantages as they do. Their uniquely slow speed allows for a lot of shenanigans that have helped me a great deal over the course of this run so far, and they even show some surprising strength against Melania. Turns out, the first half of this fight is practically free. With enough distance, you can fire a fully charged Mega Bubble, and even if she tries to dodge, which she almost always does, the bubble is so slow that 95% of the time she'll have dodged absolutely nothing and get hit anyway. It's actually kind of funny. As long as I'm able to not get shredded by the occasional waterfowl dance, Melania is content to just lore walk at me, allowing me to shoot bubbles at her until her health bar runs out. All it takes is 6 to 8 minutes of the most mind-numbingly boring gameplay you can imagine. Run, gain distance, shoot, hope she doesn't dodge to the middle of the arena because that makes it harder to build some space, and repeat. Absolutely mind-numbing. But hey, it gets the job done, and it at least lets me practice my triangle strategy for waterfowl. But if you think this fight is going to be easy because I can practically skip phase one, you're sorely mistaken. All this means is an extremely long run back until I can get another attempt at the real fight, phase two. Phase 2 always opens with the Flower Bomb, but Melania takes reduced damage until she fully recovers from the landing. It's better than nothing though, because once she does recover, she's angry. Unlike in Phase 1, Phase 2 Melania is extremely aggressive and will constantly try to rush you down, which means my bubble sniping days are over. Unfortunately, after 6 attempts over the course of 45 minutes, I wasn't able to figure anything out. She's just too oppressive, and predictably, any backup I call is more detrimental than helpful because of Melania's healing mechanic. I tried really hard to make the Mega Bubble strategies work, but it's clear that I'll have to come up with an entirely different strategy to take her out. But for now, I decide to leave her be and seek a rematch with our boy Moog, Lord of Blood. I make sure to grab the Moog Curse tier from Altus Plateau and begin the fight. This version of Moog is housed in a much larger arena than before, and I've got just enough speed to outrun him, so the same strategy that works against Melania works against Moog. It's just a matter of dodging a few strategies strikes, booking it to the other side of the arena, firing off a couple of volleys, and repeat. Just like Melania though, Phase 2 of Moog is a different story. He's able to regain almost all of the health he's lost, and he starts spraying rending fire all over the place, which is far more dangerous than it would be in any other run because of my lack of armor. Not only does it hurt on its own, but no armor means my resistance to bleeding is extremely low, so I've got to be careful where I step. On top of that, Moog is far more mobile than he was before, making it pretty difficult to build the distance that I need for a safe shot. The general approach doesn't change too terribly much from the first phase, but there are plenty of scary moments where it seems like Moog just won't stop attacking. And even though I hate to keep hammering on this fact, I'm extremely naked right now, and Moog hits like a truck. I think a couple of his attacks can even one-shot me, especially with the filth that he spews everywhere, gradually taking my health away. Moog does gain a few extra openings during this phase though, and the most important one is where he decides to fly up in the air with a wide spew. If you're fighting him normally, he'd usually follow up with a lunge in your direction, but if you're too far away from him whenever he jumps into the air, the flight amounts to nothing more than an enormous advantage for me, because it just turns into a massive backwards hop for him. This allows me to get a couple of shots in for free. I also notice that he'll occasionally begin walking perpendicular to you instead of towards you after he approaches. I was too much of a big baby coward to properly capitalize on this, but I believe that if you react quickly enough, you'll have just enough time to get a Mega Bubble out, because he doesn't ever seem to initiate an attack whenever he's strafing. So yeah, like 70% of this fight was slowly running from one side of the arena to the other and hoping I could get a shot off, while the other 30% was me screaming internally while Moog unleashes a combo from hell that won't seem to let up. It's a very tense fight, but this run and gun method was consistent enough that the encounter felt more than doable, and eventually on the sixth attempt, Moog is dead after a 12 and a half minute struggle. And with the help of a golden foul foot and Moog's very tasty soul, I finally have enough stats to make use of my carry and regal scepter. With my newfound power and the Lord of the Frenzied Flame by my side, it's time to burn this world to the ground. Having defeated Moog, Lord of Blood, and with a more powerful staff finally in my hands, I felt more confident than ever with my ability to overcome the Death Doggo himself. 
The strategy for Moog may have been slightly cheesy, but it was still extremely dangerous. If I can take down Moog though, surely I can put down another mutt, right? Well, turns out it's still extremely hard. I mentioned before that I never properly learned Malakath's attack patterns, but I definitely will have to this time around. On the bright side, my new staff allows me to crush phase one with a single FP bar. It's very convenient since I can just chug some Gatorade at the start of phase two and put all of my attention on figuring this dog out. After many deaths and a ton of experimentation, I was able to slowly learn what I could and couldn't punish. Unfortunately, even with this knowledge, the fight ends up being really slow because I have to spend so much time watching, waiting, and hoping. On top of that, his hurt box is pretty questionable, as you'll probably see in some of these clips. Sometimes the bubbles just go right through his model. It's a little frustrating because this fight is extremely scary, if for no other reason than it's hard to consistently dodge Malakath's onslaught. The first opening I found is when he bounces to the other side of the arena. He'll do it either after his three-wave ranged attack where he bounces around like a Dragon Ball Z character or simply because he feels like it. At first, I would try firing a Mega Bubble in his general direction, but as soon as the projectile spawns, he's triggered into running at me for a melee attack, and more often than not, the motion causes the Mega Bubble to miss entirely. Eventually, I pivoted to using the floating landmines instead. Interestingly, hitting every bubble seems to do more damage at this point in the game than a single Mega Bubble does, which I didn't even realize until reviewing the footage to write all this down. The second opening is his attack where he plunges his sword into the ground. If you dodge in front of him, he'll follow up with <laughs> your death, but if you dodge behind him, he'll instead cause an explosion and bounce backwards. With a little practice, you can sort of figure out the area that'll probably land and fire off some mines and just hope they hit. It's not consistent, but it works sometimes. You'd think that with as slow as some of Malekith's melee attacks are, that they'd provide a prime opportunity to clean him up. I did too at first, but the constant threat of him choosing to follow up his melee attacks with that ridiculous flurry move makes punishing his melee attacks far too dangerous. But that ridiculous flurry move is the third opening that I found. He takes forever to recover from the attack, leaving his rump wide open for a deep cleaning. <laughs> Ugh, saying that out loud, it sounds so much worse than it did in my head. A lot of the damage you deal in this fight with these bubbles comes down to a bit of luck with whether or not Malakath will just bounce away from your attack. But the bubbles linger for so long and cover such a wide area that chances are pretty good that he'll run into them anyway if he happens to dodge. So the luck isn't debilitating. After learning the fight more thoroughly and with enough patience and choosing my shots wisely, I finally took down Malakath on the 14th attempt after 9 minutes with just under seven of those minutes being spent on phase two alone. After defeating Malekith, I wake up in Pompeii and realize that I have a sacred duty that was entrusted to me that is very, very important. I've got to beat up an old man. And would you look at that, there just so happens to be an old man hiding out inside this building. Lucky me. As is customary with my runs, I die to Gideon on the very first attempt, which means I don't get the free shots while he's monologuing anymore. No big deal. The tried and true method of running to the other side of the arena arena is still useful here. I still have to watch out for his projectiles, but there's plenty of openings here as long as you don't give him any time to shove a comet down your throat at least. A few dodges and punishes, and Gideon is down for the count. Next up is... Oh, another old man? Today must be my lucky day! Future's now! Godfrey, predictably, behaves much like his ghostly shadow. For the first portion of the fight, I can easily outrange him and pepper him with cleaning solution. After dealing a bit of damage, though, he becomes far more aggressive and doesn't really give me a chance to squeeze out my mop anymore, so I gotta get up close and personal. So I went back to a similar strategy that helped my stone digger defeat this guy, dodge his attacks towards his left side, and hope that he falls into a loop. Once I got the rhythm down, Godfrey was toast. It turned out to be slightly more difficult to execute this strategy than normal because of the extra distance covered by my fast rolling, but it's no big deal. It's Hora Lu's turn though, and he's pretty scary. I've been thinking about this fight off and on for the entire run, knowing that it might be extremely difficult, so I came in with a strategy. Hora Lu will, at a pretty regular interval, roar and start his earthquake attack. I theorized that I had just enough time to get out of the danger zone and fire a bubble, so that's what I tried. I would run around like a scared puppy until he jumped, 
Then I'd dodge, run to safety, and fire away, and it worked. Extremely well, in fact. I'm not really good at fighting this guy with more traditional methods, but I've at least learned how to not die. I tried to keep my eyes open for a chance to give him a quick wash, and I got maybe one or two cheeky shots in, but most of my damage came from punishing his earthquake. And with a nice finish that I'm lucky didn't cost me the attempt due to my absolute hubris. After about 22 minutes, Godfrey and Horalu went down on the first attempt. Really didn't expect that. Now we have the golden boy himself, Radagon of the Golden Order. This is another fight that was on my mind throughout this run, mostly because he likes to parry and punish projectiles, and yes, he definitely can parry my Mega Bubble. I thought that these spells might be way too slow and that he'd parry so much that I'd have to make an exception to my no weapons rule and bring a clay man harpoon to the fight. But it turns out that even Radagon has quite a few very slow attacks where I can fit a quick bubbling in. It's mostly just his heavier hammer swings that finish up combos, his tiny wave of gold, his Elden Ring three-parter, and his attacks that leave a huge circular golden imprint on the ground where he doesn't follow up. He's got way more attacks that are unable to be punished than ones that can, but he's so relentless that there are more than enough good opportunities if you know what to look for. It took some calibrating on my part, but I was able to clean him up for the first time on the fifth attempt after just under six and a half minutes. I'm glad too, because I really thought that it would take much longer and that he'd be much harder. But this golden man is no match for the Elden Roll, I guess. Hell, I'll probably still remember this fight until I'm in my 90s because of that stupid run. <laughs> Of course you know we're not quite done with him yet though, because there's no way I'll take out the Elden Beast on my first try, right? Well, yeah, no. I put up a valiant effort and I got real close, but I was sloppy and took a ton of unnecessary hits and got finished off by a brutal Elden Stars and Fire Breath combo. In just about any other run with the resources I had, I probably could have pulled it off first try, but because I'm not wearing armor, I have to chug a flask after just about every hit, so I don't have a lot of leniency when when it comes to the more painful mistakes. The next attempt didn't go much better, and I died to the shooting stars attack that I was always able to dodge pretty easily before, but for some reason, it keeps clipping me or outright killing me now. Still trying to figure that one out. The next two attempts were ended by the golden boy himself, but the next two attempts were insane. Everything lined up perfectly and I was absolutely on fire with my reactions and decision making, and Radagon was dead after just a little over three minutes without taking a single hit. If any attempt is meant to take it all the way, it's gotta be this one. I simply must put my hitless bubble kill of Radagon down in the record books for history and... Oh, come on! Ugh, not gonna lie. Uh, that death hurt. A lot. Oh well, at least I managed to get my revenge on the very next attempt. It wasn't a three-minute hitless Radagon run. More like a six-minute fight where I went into the Elden Beast with only three flasks and my physic remaining. I wasn't super confident in taking out the Elden Beast because Radagon went so poorly, but it actually went super well. The only source of damage that I took in this entire fight was from some particularly tenacious Elden Stars that shaved away half of my health by itself, and I was able to be so aggressive that I ended up finishing off the Elden Beast in just over six minutes, even scoring a stance break at the very end. And there it is, Elden Ring beaten as a Clayman Oracle. But we're not done yet. We've got some unfinished business. After all, what kind of janitor would I be if I didn't clean up the source of all rot in this world? So it's back to Melania. With all my newfound power, phase one goes a little bit quicker than before. It's still a mind-numbingly boring part of the fight that takes an average of around five minutes per attempt just to get minced almost immediately in phase two. It's super demoralizing simply because of how extremely tedious it is, but I keep pushing. I'm stubborn. Phase one gives me a ton of opportunities to practice my triangle strategy against the duck dance, so even though it's still extremely nerve-wracking, only three of my deaths were caused by that attack in Phase 2. No, the main source of my issues came from Melania's Shadow Clone Nojutsu. I died to this attack so many times. I know that many people never have trouble with this attack at all, but it's always been extremely difficult for me to read, so I went online to find some help and began trying to practice a specific rolling pattern, mostly unsuccessfully, against that attack. Beyond just surviving, I had to find some safe and consistent openings to exploit. The best opening she has is her enormous windup. 
In Phase 1, she operates a lot like Margit, either doing an extremely punishable in-place attack or a slightly less punishable attack that moves forwards towards you. In Phase 2 though, it seems like she'll almost always opt for the more punishable close-range version, especially if you stay somewhat near her. Once I realized this, that attack moved straight to the top of my wish list for Christmas this year. Just lay some mines, and since that attack of hers is so slow, the mines will be out before she fully recovers, so she won't try to dodge. Most of the time she'll run right through the minefield, but sometimes she'll do a soaring attack and avoid them entirely. The next best opening you get is the same jump attack that she has in Phase 1. It comes with an explosion this time, and she seems to use this attack extremely rarely in this phase, so it can be pretty difficult to react to. If you do happen to see it coming though, you can lay some mines and hope that she just doesn't strafe away. The last opening, and by far her most common, is her coin flip follow-up jumping attack that she'll sometimes do after finishing one of her many combos that results in a punish window. This is what I chose to play around for the most part. Dodge, dodge, dodge until she finally does an attack that can give her that coin flip and hope she launches up into the air. If it's waterfowl, you're probably screwed, but if it's not, you'll want to stay beneath her just long enough for her to slam into the ground. If you dodge away too early, there's a chance that the slam will turn into a swoop, which we want to avoid. But if you dodge backwards after she starts falling, you can roll far enough away to be out of range of her follow-up explosion and then fire some bubbles. It takes so long for her to recover that the bubbles will be out just before she can move, so if your timing is good, she won't even bother dodging. This was by far the most consistent and most reliable damage window that I found, and it's pretty good. My bubbles were hitting her hard, too. Like 100 damage per small bubble hard. That means if I somehow landed a full volley, that's a whopping 900 damage for one punish. Not bad at all. The main goal here is to survive and chip away at her health until she reaches around 40%, where she'll get desperate and start weaving her Scarlet Aeonia into the fight. This, of course, is just one dodge away from a completely free opening, where I'd launch a fully charged Mega Bubble, an uncharged Mega Bubble, and finish with laying some bubble mines just in case. This is also where my heart rate skyrocketed, because getting her this deep into the encounter is extremely difficult. You've gotta survive so many duck dances and shadow clones just to reach this phase of the fight, and I knew that there would be plenty more to come. When I finally got her to that phase for the first time, I was freaking out. Of course, I couldn't just neglect the rest of her openings, so I would just play as normal until she dive bombs me again. And then this happens. Holy crap. Yeah, I suppose that's a major risk of punishing her finisher like that. I panicked so hard when I saw her leap up into her waterfowl stance, you have no idea. I can't believe she didn't kill me there. She even had the gall to do this to me twice in the same fight during this phase. So rude. I'm the girl with the gall. I did manage to get decent enough at dodging the shadow clone attack though, but it still feels extremely sketchy to me, like I should have gotten hit at least three times, but I didn't, so I I can't complain. As high as the stress is before the Aeonia phase, it's even more intense when you're this close to finally closing it out. With a little luck, a ton of patience, and one final Scarlet Aeonia, Melania finally goes down after 10 and a half minutes in phase 2 alone. Jeez. If you've ever thought about fighting Melania naked, think again. Would not recommend. That took me 14 attempts over an hour and 45 minutes. And that's not even counting the hour or so that I sunk into her before all of this. And if those numbers sound low to you, you've got to remember that this is also on top of the other dozens of hours that I've put into her across all of my videos and personal playthroughs. So yeah, to say that this was rough is an understatement. But it's done. I know that there's plenty more bosses to defeat, but I'm satisfied. The world is as clean as I could possibly get it in this form, so there's nothing left to do but return to the Elden Tree and become the Lord of the Frenzied Bubble. I tried to be the kind clay man, but the world showed me that it wasn't ready to be kind back. So what better way to make this world spotless than to burn it all to the ground? This was an extremely fun run, way harder but also way easier than I thought it would be. This spell may be slow as hell, but it offers so many fun and interesting unique advantages that I wasn't expecting and proved itself to be a really valuable asset. It's also surprisingly strong at endgame, I had no idea. 100 damage per bubble is nothing to scoff at. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this run as much as I did. Oh, and can you do me a favor? If you like my style and don't 
don't mind watching a non-Elden Ring challenge run, please, please, please go watch my Doom 2016 No Jump run. I released it last month, but you'd be forgiven for not knowing since this platform absolutely buried it under more ash than what's on top of the city of Landel. I worked really hard on it, and it's got some really cool tech in it, so you'd be crazy to skip on it. As always, a big old shout out goes to all of my wonderfully generous patrons who help make this platform's silly inconsistencies just a bit more bearable. And hey, I hate doing this, and I wouldn't be asking if YouTube didn't practically demand it from me, so let's give this a try. If you like this stuff and want to see more in the future, be sure to like, subscribe, and especially tickle that little notification bell so you don't miss any of my content in the future. And thanks for watching. If you made it all the way here to the end, I'd love it if you snuck some sort of cleaning pun into your comment. Can't wait to read those. Alright, see you next time.